finish the attack and specifically the role of the number nine. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by my esteemed colleague and former number nine, Jimmy Gilligan, who, who played for a number of different clubs, but more commonly renowned for his spells at Watford, Cardiff and Swansea and, and scored over how many goals, Jimmy? Over 80, 80 odd goals. Yeah, so hopefully between Jimmy and myself, uh, we'll have some good experience and input where we can share some insight into uh, performance problems around the role of the number nine and finishing the attack in the modern game. So first of all, we'll, we'll, we'll just go on to our next slide and just give everyone a little gentle reminder about the principles of play and specifically the, the left-hand side of the model where you can see the in-possession um, characteristics and just to bring that to life a little bit more, we're just going to roll onto a video which should sort of exacerbate and highlight and and really, really share some some fascinating montage and footage of some goals that you'll see coming up. Okay, we, we're just going to come onto this slide now, which should give you an insight and share some some of the DNA language we use internally with the FA. And I'm just going to invite Jimmy Gilligan to talk around some of the specifics of some of your experiences, Jimmy, over the last couple of months with national teams. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, just obviously looking at this board or or this graphic, you know, that you're talking about now. Obviously, the thing for us, I think, and, and you were a you know top class striker as well, and if you're talking about the role of number nine, for me, the first thing I'm thinking about is looking at that that triangle. Um, and this is a lot of work that's been done by Aaron Danks previously and some of the, the guys and girls that have been on the course uh, and are on this and listening to this webinar will actually hear him talk about this triangle and where a lot of goals are scored from. But for me, that's where the number nine should be in and around the box most of the time. But you're talking about um, when you talk about DNA, you talk about wide crosses. So it's runners in behind. So both lanes one and lanes five. Um, you're putting a cross in from a wide area and from quite deep, really. Reason that they're doing that is that they're trying to get that ball in behind uh, a back three or a back four that's running back to goal and causing problems. So it's it's in there 
um, the, it's called the triangle now, where you score the goals from. It used to be the Pomo, could be called the corridor of uncertainty. So can you get that ball in to that area as quick as possible to cause uh, problems for the opposition? Um, when you look in the next box, the two blue boxes, they're called inbox crosses um, or inbox cross. So it's, it's the, what type of cross do you want from there? So the closer you get to the, the byline, you're looking at pulling it back inside that triangle. So it's it's a deeper pullback cross, maybe to, you know, six yard box uh, penalty spot and even out as far back as the, the um, 18 yard line. So it's called an inbox cross. Um, and that that's really where you're looking at the, the centre forward is going to do his movement or her movement to try and outwit the opponent that's marking them. So we'll see later on in, in the presentation uh, around movement. So that's where movement would take place more so than the wider crossing where it's a, it's a duel that's going on. Um, you've got to look at that, uh, the cleverness and the creativity in this area, in that triangle area as well. You might have quick combination play. Um, and then as you come back away from the triangle, you look at the penetrative passes, you see the top players now that can thread that, the ball through what we call through the eye of the needle um, uh, into into a, a forward runner that, that, that ends up finishing the attack for you. So there's a number of things that, that the, the DNA or the England teams will work on in terms of finishing the attack from wide areas, finishing in the attack from the in-box cross area, obviously finishing the attack where most goals are scored in the triangle, Steve, really. Yeah, I think it's, I, I definitely can remember it being called the second six yard box from sort of my days. And yeah. you know, there's lots of, there's lots of terms and vocabulary that's used for it. But I think specifically when you talk about the number nine, that's where a lot of the goals come from. I know much later in, in this, in this workshop, we have got some, some, some visual graphics in terms of where goals are scored from. But I mean, there, there is a variety from, from number nines. And I think, you know, about Alan Shearer and he'd score, you know, 30 yarders from outside the box. I think Harry Kane's probably got that ability. And I think some of the videos and some of the footage will come and show Tammy, Abra Tammy Abraham is perhaps that triangle finisher who doesn't score many yeah. goals outside of that. And I think it shows and hopefully will will enlighten some of the some of the viewers on this sort of workshop of the different types of number nines that you have. There's not one size fits all. And even no. going back to your first point, Jimmy, where those wide crosses, where, where Beckham used to put those early whip crosses in, Trent Alexander-Arnold does it nowadays. But it's just an, an understanding of those relationships between the crosser and the number nine and or any others that may get in the box in terms of midfield runners, a, a shadow striker, a number 10, or even the opposite winger making the far post. Yeah, Steve, I think that, you you know, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's that relationship. So if you're playing in a team with, when or the lads that played in the team with David Beckham, they know it's coming in as soon as he gets into that area. You know, he's not going to probably go past someone on the outside, but he's going to be putting it in. If he gets that half a yard, he's, he's bending it round it, he's coming in, it's, it's coming away, it's bending away from the goalkeeper. You know, if you're a defender going on to the ball, you could put it into your own net. I, I couldn't agree more. And just going on to that sort of throwback striker, if it, and a lot of people will know this name um, because of match of the day, Gary Lineker. Gary Lineker was was called the fox in the box because he scored most of his goals in that six-yard area. He didn't really do a lot else outside of that. Hmm. I think it's an interesting point and I know we're going to show some clips which will highlight all this stuff and the amount of um, attributes and characteristics that, are, that a number nine must have nowadays and I know that we're talking about everyone's different but it looks totally different if you're up front on your own as a single, if you're up in a pair, if you're playing one up and one just off and I think those little nuances and those relationships and understanding between you are vital and hopefully We'll just come on to a video now where it will bring to life some of this England DNA and some of the language with some of the national teams and some of their footage. So we'll just move on to the next video where hopefully this will come to life a little bit more. So in old fashioned money, Jimmy, we're talking about making the pitch big. It doesn't matter who it is, the flexibility to, to stretch the pitch and make it as wide as possible. Yeah, absolutely. That gives the opposition a problem. You know, do they go out? Do they stay compact? If they stay compact and it goes out into lane one and five, so all time width, then you'll be able to get the ball in the box. I 
I think what you've got there as well, you know, Harry so Kane operating between, between those the lines. two, the two central defenders. Yeah. That's a penetrative path we just talked about there, Steve. And another one coming up now. I think what, you, what you've got in this little shot as well is as Kane drops off to just come and play that pass around the corner in behind, you've got Sterling, who's obviously the flexibility coming off the line and stretch and pin the opposition. So it doesn't matter who drops off, but someone has to have that understanding to running behind and pin and stretch them. Yeah. So here's the inbox cross, just bending it away from that keeper. Okay, so we'll, we'll come on to um, some discussions now where we're going to talk specifically and, and we'll repeat some footage about what the challenges are around the number nine when finishing the attack. So this should be... Um, a video footage now that should show Harry Kane in his goal against Montenegro. And we're just going to play it through and we'll just talk over it and around it, Jimmy. And we'll, perhaps we'll just play it through and just have a little watch first. And so to most viewers, that probably seems a pretty simple finish. And we've watched this back, haven't we, repeatedly. And you're linking everything yeah. now and we talk about Harry Kane's pass, but his ability, desire and drive to make the far post. Yeah, if you, you know, just from the start of the video, and I know we're going to probably watch it a couple of times, but for me, once he plays that ball and he's the number nine, he's out wide, he plays that ball. Uh, and then he quick, what I call quickens himself up. Uh, that means he, he just intensifies his pace a little bit to get to where he wants to be. Now, if you look at this touch here, look, that's that futsal type of touch that we say. Now, if he goes, if he if he hits a shot straight, the centre half blocks it, but he yeah. knows the centre half's going to block it. So he, he, he nigh on reverse passes it into the net. It's an absolute bit of genius, in my opinion. You know, so when we look at that in fast mode from, from the start, it just looks like a, a just a decent goal. It's good touch, good goal. But when you break it down and you, you slow it down, you know, as I say, if he goes straight now, the the, the, the defender for Montenegro could get a, could could block it. But he doesn't, and he, he plays it back across the defender and, and like a reverse pass into the corner. And I equally think as as the as the the, the ball goes into the net and you, the, the camera pans away, the goalkeepers can't get his feet moving either. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right. I mean, when you look at it first hand and very, very quickly and the game happens so quickly, it looks a simple finish. He's in front of the, he's in front of the defender. It's a little short, sharp, tight touch and he's able to get his shot off at goal. But when you look at the, the detail behind it and the ability and the quickness of thought that, that Harry's got, it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic finish. And you think where he came from, and I know this is brilliant now because we're going to go through it again. You look at the all-time width where it's initially yeah. Harry, we talk about, you know, Harry trying to stay between the width of the, width of the 18 yard box because he's a number nine. And this is a simple pass back. But you look now to Chilwell and the, the, the speed, it's probably five or six seconds. And now he's just pulling on that the, the back, isn't he, of that central defender? Yeah. I mean, it's a great finish all around. It is really, really adept, clinical well thought and clever where perhaps Harry Kane doesn't quite get the recognition that he deserves for some of these these little technical clever finishes. It's it's a yeah, Steve, I think you're absolutely right, you know. Um and when you when we slow it down and we show it like we are doing here, you really can see the the technical ability of, of Kane. And also the last little bit for me is that he gets very low as he get and and, and it, there's even a little ricochet there that he has to deal with coming off there, but watch him as he as he as he goes to reverse pass or shoot, if you want to call it. His body's low, so now he's he, so he's over the ball, so he's not going to lift the ball high. That's for sure. 
and he's staying over the ball, but balanced. And, you know, that's, people sometimes say, how does he, how does he get to do that? He will have done those things in training. And we talk about the three R's, the realism, relevance, repetition. Um, he will have done those things so many times in training. And I guarantee that that won't be a one-time thing that he's done. You know, it, it looked to me like there was an unconscious competence in what he did there. I think it's um, when you talk about training as well, Jimmy, this, this one of my bugbears with some of the sessions that I see quite a lot. In a training ground situation, that could be unopposed, it could be opposed, but that may get viewed and perceived as quite a scruffy finish where yeah. in training, yeah. the importance of hitting the back of the net continuously, having that that single-mindedness and ruthless design, no matter it was. Keepers used to go mad at me because I'd be blasting them in from five yards and just yeah. enjoying hitting the back of the net time and time again because that experience and that confidence that you build up in training, whether it's against mannequins, an individual defender with its group work. I used to celebrate a goal in training like it would have been a 40-yarder on a match day, and I think perhaps that's dying out the game a little bit. I, I think... Great point, Steve. And, and later on, when we come on to the little um, practice designs that we've done, you know, one of the things I write down there is enjoy celebrating goals because I'm, I'm with you. I, I see people scoring training on train grounds and it's there's a deathly silence to it. And I think, no, don't, you know, go and enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we're going to come on to the next video now, which is Tammy Abraham's goal. So we'll, we'll play this through and then we'll just have a little chat around it, Jimmy. So Tammy's not even in the picture yet. There he is. And this is not a simple goal, is it? Because we've watched this and it's not a first phase finish. It's a second no. and even third phase finish. It's interesting there. He's pointing, you know, he, he points to where he wants the ball, although it goes behind him. At, like you're saying now, he's, he's, he's not switching off. So yeah, for, there's that triangle as well. Jimmy, we spoke yeah, about. I was going to say, Steve, for me, what's really interesting from the first phase is that Tammy doesn't come out of the triangle. Um, he stays around in that triangle and, and, and he knows that if he's patient, he's going to get that chance again. So we look at his movement here. There's a little jink of the shoulder just to say I'm going one way and then going the other. Uh, and I don't know whether the defender sees it, but, you know, it's great play from Tammy. I think there's a couple of things for me, for me, Jimmy, when I look at that and I think how many strikers would have got frustrated and annoyed they didn't get the first cross. And they'd have yeah. been looking at the gods or looking at the floor and uh, and so annoyed that they didn't make contact because the, the defender, to be fair to him, got a little flick. But you're right, he stays alive, he stays engaged, he's in and around it trying to have a little regain within a couple of yards. And I think that little, the little movement away to get across the near post is perhaps something that Tammy, he has done. But perhaps if I was one of those defenders, I may have expected him more to actually pull on the far post for an aerial little, yeah. little dink or a little chip. So, you know, we spoke, haven't we, Jimmy, about the disguise, the confusion, and at times over the period of game, actually sucking the defenders into a little bit of, well, actually, I'm going to go there. And you do that two or three times. So the defender then thinks it becomes a habit. And then the next one, you dart and you do something different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point, Steve. Sometimes you have to... You know, you have to outwit very good defenders and, and some of the defenders now that these, these players are playing against are top class. So you might, for want of a word, you might let them have the first one or two against you. You might even let them have the third. But then on that fourth piece uh, or part of play, you, you, then all of a sudden what you do is you you go to a different place, you, you make a different movement or you make a different run. And then all of a sudden, before they know it, you, you, you've, you've outwitted them. One thing I want to say about that finish there, if Tammy doesn't open his right foot up enough, that 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 sort of shot or that surface that he's using takes that 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 cross outside the near post and he misses the target. If you watch it from behind the goal, he just opens his foot up enough to say, right, it's it's on target. If he doesn't open his foot up, it's it's going to go wide. So I don't know if we can see it. We might see it from a different angle here. Um, there's his little movement. Just opens that foot up again. I don't. I think we might get a shot of it from behind the goal mm. um, at some point. Again, a good cross. A cross that's asking a question of, of defenders as well. Six-yard box. So in the triangle again. So he just opened. You can see his body shape now. If he just hold that there, that's great. So if he goes with what I'd call a a normal a normal frame there, I think that comes past the keeper's left 
right foot as, as I'm looking at it now, and it goes wide. But he just opens up a little bit, Steve, in order for that to, to give the keeper a problem, it, and it's on target, and the keeper has to deal with it. Yeah, I think, yeah, you make a great point in terms of the surface he's decided to go with is the biggest surface, but yeah. using using the pace of the cross to direct it on goal. And, you know, we've been in that position a million times, Jimmy, where that, that looks a simple finish. He's six yards out, but it's not. And you've got to use that pace and just direct it towards the goal. It's almost, you know, a 90 degree from where Sancho crossed the ball in. But you've got yeah. to make firm contact. And because he's so close to the goalkeeper, the goalkeeper, the goalkeepers nowadays can't react. But how no. often do we see those simple ones? And I know we've got one coming up with Dominic Calvert-Lewin where the connection is vital. And sometimes yeah. the goalkeeper, it may hit the goalkeeper in the face, but it's that belief that you will get another opportunity and just using that power and, and decisiveness and ruthlessness to say it's going to be a good contact. And if the goalkeeper saves it, it does. But the law of averages will probably dictate that he won't. Um, yeah, this is the next one, Jimmy, where I think this is the Dominic Calvert-Lewin header I was referring to. So this is one of our most recent games. And I think we've, but we've definitely been in this position. I might have even missed this one. But the, the, the importance, again, of hitting good contact and the, the patience he shows. So just, just if we can just stop it there, if that's OK. He's, he's already had a look. So he's, he's looked away from the ball to see what if there's anything in behind. Um, so I think that's great play. So look at his eyes. His eyes are on the ball um, and his position now, he's, he, for me, he's in the box seat yeah. because he's dictating where he wants. He, he's not being dictated to by a defender. He's dictating to the defender where he wants to go. Yeah. And Jimmy, I, I just want to make a point on this. You, you're spot on. You can see here Bukayo Saka making the far post. You look at the defender's position, scanning, looking. Yeah. He's not doing that at this moment in time and almost threatening and giving him something to think about. In the box, that's actually a 2v1. So yes. it's, it's a little bit more simple to defend. So, you know, you go back to the DNA language and that graphic we showed at the, at the, at the beginning. The runners in behind and the penetrating runs to support crosses in the box is vital because this, this goal may not have happened if he doesn't make that run. No. So if we just move on then. Brilliant. So you just, you, you, I think when we were, were looking at this workshop, Steve, you took, you talked about him being on the bubble, yeah. um, which is, is a great phrase, a great terminology. So you look at him here, like we say, he has that little look there. Now he knows where he wants to be. He's in that triangle. Now he's on the bubble. As, as Jack Grealish has got, he's on the ball. He's on a situation now where he's just, he needs to be patient. If he goes early, he, he doesn't receive the ball. If he goes too late, he doesn't receive the ball. So it's just that waiting, waiting, waiting situation. So I if we move it on. I, I think Sorry, Steve. Is, no, I think this is a really good still because we spoke as well, didn't we, about chemistry and relationships. We know the ability Jack Grealish has got that he's shown in the Premier League and in the recent England games. You don't know what Jack's going to do. Is he going to go on the outside? We all know that Jack Grealish is predominantly right-footed, so he has got space to drive on the outside. But knowing his ability, he can come inside. And I think where Dominic Calvert-Lewin now is ready to pounce, he probably knows at this period in the game he's got the better, he's got the better of the centre-back if he leaps and times his jump early. But he's not getting in too early. So if the cross is hung up just a little bit behind him, he's anticipating both sides of the coin here. He's just delaying his run just a touch. And I think it's a fascinating... It's a fascinating still because we don't see too many strikers nowadays that do this. There he is, just on the bubble, look, just anticipating and waiting. Grealish gets half a yard and then he gambles in between them. Yeah, it's, it's uh, like you say, Steve, he, he, he does everything right. He does everything right. You know, the, the, the defender, you could argue the defender should be side on. But, you know, he's such a... And, and even then, he's still got a bit to do because... The keeper's there. The key, if, if Dominic Calvert-Lewin isn't brave as well, yeah. then I'm not too sure. Because look at the keeper. The keeper comes. He's starting to not rush it as such, but he's going across the goal. Dominic, and, and what Dominic does really well is he heads that ball down, So, but he heads it down with power as well. Yeah, I think you, you talk about the bravery that modern centre-forwards you know, have to have. And it's not just, you know, that particular position on the pitch, but, you know, you've got centre-backs, you've got boots flying, you've got goalkeepers coming out with fists that they now protect themselves with a knee up. And he necessarily might not know what's coming in here. But again, it's that firm contact, it's that right angle 
of hitting it back into the floor. He's using the power of the cross. And he could have got a fist in the face here, but his desire to get a goal for his country is, is, is obvious. There's, a, there's only one thing on his mind, and that's scoring. And that's that's wonderful to see. As you know, Steve, we see many times that that, that might take a nick off a, a centre-forward's head and go wide, but n- not with him. You know, if it's going in the box and he's getting on the end of it, it's going to be, it's going, to be going to goal, hopefully. But brilliant, brilliant goal. Yeah, it is. And again, it looks very simplistic, but when you pick out, you know, some of the detail behind it and linking in some of the other players. It's it's fascinating how the whole sort of team chemistry and and the justification of the way you want to play becomes comes paramount and obviously visible to us when when you look at the tactical cam at Wembley. And I think I think there, Steve. Just before we move on, the last thing I'd say on that, and I know we're going to touch on it later on, is that you know when the coaches, the, the, you know, ladies and gentlemen, that watch this. Um, this big marker, when they're thinking about practice design, what, you know, it's not just a crossing and finishing session. You've got to give and you've got to put challenges in the way for your forwards to deal with. Uh, and especially if you're, you're working with your number nine. So, you know, think about what we've talked about here, the detail, and then look at it, take it, work from work from the goal back. And how do you want to set up your, your finishing practice for a Dominic calvert Lewin who's 14, 15 years of age, if that's the situation? Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting point, Jimmy. And and I think with some of the goals we've seen already, particularly Harry Kane and Dominic Calvert-Lewin, if you think about their journeys to the top as well, you know, we're seeing them here play for their countries at international stage. But both of those had loan spells. You know, Harry went out on loan, didn't he, to Leighton Orient, Millwall, Leicester and Norwich. And I think Dominic Calvert-Lewin was Northampton and, and, and Staleybridge Celtic. Yes. So look at their journeys their experiences they built up in those leagues and the frustration, the facing against the physical battles, facing against the, the horrible pitches, not the not the beautiful surface we see here in front of us, where they, they've actually gained those understanding and had that little bit extra time to develop and, and understand what the game is about. So I think that's not to be forgotten about. No, I agree. So I think this goal now, we, we, we just move on to... Um, oh no, this is sorry, the next slide. So, yeah, we're just going to talk, aren't we, in a little bit further detail about some of the skills and some of the attributes that the centre forwards have to possess now and specifically overcoming the, the game challenges that the modern day presents. Now, again, this comes on to another fantastic um, goal and, and a little bit of footage, which is about Sancho and Harry Kane and their sort of ability to, to link up together. So, we're just going to play this video through and we'll just have a conversation about this one. And, you know, look at this, England haven't even got the ball at this point. No, it's interesting where Kane's dropped into at that point there. And now watch where he is. So all of a sudden, that transition, Steve, has taken Harry Kane 20 20 yards up the pitch in, in an instant. And just, just, so if we, if, you know, I know we'll look at it again, but... Again, the the unselfishness of Harry Kane, and we see this obviously with him week on week in, in the Premier League with Tottenham now, but what, watch it now as soon as we win the ball back here. Bang. So can we stop it at all? Don't know if we can. There you go. Right, just the reason yeah, I wanted to it. stop it is I just want to talk about... Yeah, thanks. The, the reason I want to talk about it, Steve, is that... The unselfishness in Harry Kane, and I see strikers now, and this is this is a bugbear of mine, is that when when England won that ball back, I see so many strikers want to go towards the ball straight away. What Harry Kane done straight away was open the pitch up for England to play. Now he's he's in oceans, he, you know, he's got oceans of space to run into, and he's taken that. And I just think that that's a great thing to be showing young girls and boys. A top class striker who's on his game at the peak of his career saying, I don't need to be involved there right now, but what I will do is I'll create something for someone else. Does he really sit there and think that in his mind? No, he won't, but he'll have done it a million times in training, as we've already said before. So if we carry on, Steve, sorry. No problem. There you go. I think we we, we tried to highlight here, didn't, didn't we, Jimmy, the amount of yeah. times that Harry Kane scans and views and looks around. And I That's think the final ball that plays into the far post, it shows him and the understanding he's got to drive away to create space for others. So he's had he's had three scans there, Steve, already. Fourth scan. And 
And then his movement, his ability to make that little movement, turn his feet round. And everyone knows what he's doing there. He's, he's ready for the bits and pieces. If Sancho doesn't score and there's a rebound, Harry Kane's on the end of it. Yeah. I think I think for me as well, that, that is it. I think that the the desire that Harry Kane has got to be, you know, England's top goal scorer and he wants to score in every goal. He wants to, he wants to play in every... Sorry, he wants to score in every Spurs game. He's still at the far post there in case of a tap-in or the cross yeah. is put back. And a lot of the other... A lot of other players would have perhaps just turned the bat there and thought, oh, it's not my goal. He's always looking for that second, third phase for the what if. What is a scenario if, don't, if, if we don't score off this? Even if it's a regain, he's got to go and press the ball high again. I think you, you look here, Jimmy, as well, the desire and the pace again, of England and again, to break on the transition. Yeah. Yeah. What I was going to say, Steve, there is it's lovely to see when when we do score, when Sancho does score, you've got, I think it's Barclay, you've got Raheem Sterling going in and you've got Harry Kane. So you've got three England players in the box queuing up as well. You know, sometimes yeah. we all see it in the modern game. There's only one in the box from a cross or a pass um, and they've got a lot to do. But that, that's a great example. Yeah, really good. I, th I think this, you know, even you go back to this here, Jimmy, when you, you look at Harry Kane's position and... Yeah. We're defending here, he could be dropping into a mid block, he could be trying to tackle and, and pressurize the, the, the opposition player from behind. But he understands the value of A, trusting his teammates to do to do and execute their jobs, but B, his importance to to pin and stretch the opposition back up to the to the halfway line. Because if we run it back there, he could be in, in one pass if it's in behind. But for, for that but that that is that picture there and that that still cannot be sort of just swept under the carpet in terms of the value of stretching the opposition and, and giving them something to think about. And again, he's in between the two centre-backs. Yeah, it's a great point, Steve. And he's off. And like we say, you've, we've highlighted those four scans, really. You know, and, and if we talk about what's he scanning for, he's scanning for space, he's scanning for the defender, defenders. And I bet he knows that Sancho's coming in on that far side as well. So he'll know. He'll know yeah. what he needs to do. The time, the timing of the movement that takes him and takes the two centre halves out or the two defenders out is excellent as well. He waits and waits and waits. Just goes a little, there you go. That one. And that that step or those two steps there is enough to take that left-sided centre half out of the game. Yeah, and I think you look at Sancho as well yeah, and the finish, he's had a little hesitation, hasn't he? A little stop in case he's going to pull it back. He's waiting for the defender almost to plant his feet just there and he goes again and creates that half a yard. And when you're that, when you're that close to goal again, it's that, yeah. it's that power, it's that contact. It's not, it's not a, a laces finish. He hasn't struck it through. It's just a simple side foot finish. But he knows what he's doing there, Sancho, as well. Okay, so we, we're just moving on here to the to the four corner model. And again, this is a reminder that long term player development can be applied to all players. Um, it's a lens to observe, reflect, decide on how you can support your your individual players, depending on their individual players need at any moment in time. And each four corner is not to be looking in isolation. Jimmy? Yeah, I think, Steve, on this, this is, uh, you know, the four corner model here uh, for for a number nine is is like you say you can't take any of these in isolation they're they're what you end up i believe helping to develop your number nine into so you've got your technical tactical we spoke about that with with a number of the videos that we've shown all, all, already today uh, the ones i want to talk about are the psychological cool so the one the striker is that you know you can't be scared you're going to miss the target you can't be afraid to shoot. You can't be afraid to take that chance. And if I go back to the three R's, the more you practice that, the more you allow players to practice it and not just give them five minutes and ten minutes at the end of the game. Don't have sight. And then point become more senior and they become a first-team player and they go for a barren spell. So, so 
and what are they going through? The gold shrinks, the gets bigger. Very true. The coach just to give me a bag of ball. Yeah, just maybe a, a coach serving me the ball. No goalkeeper in the way. Just getting a feel of that ball hitting the right surface at the right time. Um, and that would really help me. And then the physical one, you know, we look at players, the modern day player now, they're in unbelievable shape. They're physically strong. They're not really bulky in terms of having to use that bulk to hold people off, but they've got that physical strength. And when you when you know you physically are stronger or you've got the ability to hold the ball up and you've got the ability to beat your opponent, psychologically, that really, really can help you as well. So, you know, to be in a good physical condition to to uh, hold the ball up, to be able to link play up, to be able to speed the game up. I think all these things are really, really important. And obviously, I think you've already hit on the this, this social, Steve, about partnerships. You know, when we talked about Beckham early doors with that crossing or, you know, uh, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold. Um, it, it's it's one of them situations of you look at you look at relationships on the pitch, but I bet that they're social off the pitch as well. And that would have that would have happened in your day. It would have happened in my day that ironically, the people who help supply you, you end up having relationships with in terms of getting on with really well. And I don't know whether um, it, that just is because that you end up on the same wavelength or you just end up being really good friends. But it certainly happened in my days. I ended up, you know, really good friends with people who were, I'm going to call it in, in a way, my sort of goal supplier. Mm. Yeah, I can definitely, it definitely resonates for me, particularly the last point, but some of the, some of the four corner, four corner model aspects you've mentioned are, are integral. I think that the psychological aspect of, even when you miss a you miss a chance, it's how quickly can you forget about it and move on to the next one. Yeah. I think you know, as a striker, quite early on in a game, I'd be weighing up the centre backs. I'd be looking at them, thinking, well, who've I got the better of? Who can, who can I suck in? Who can I run in behind? Who can I pin? Who can I beat in the air? And you know, what some of these traits of the opponents nowadays, you've got that before you even start the game with performance analysis. You've got you know, guys and girls being drip fed information about what foot they are, what they can't do, how quick they are, how slow they are. They can't win a header. They jump off the left foot, they jump off the right foot. All of these little characteristics of your opponents allows the centre forward to gain a deeper understanding. And at some point in that game, football obviously is, is a team of 11 players and you may not get a chance until the 89th, 90th, 90th minute. And it's that single mindedness and uh, drive determination to keep making those runs, even though you've had five or six that haven't arrived at that spot because of number of reasons. And you look at the Tammy Abraham one there where he got frustrated. That could have been in the 95th minute. And if he doesn't make that run again to get back across him, that goal doesn't happen. And that's where I see, and I can definitely remember some of the goals that I scored in the last couple of minutes where, you know, I had jelly legs. I didn't really want to make them run. I looked at a particular player and I thought, well, he's not going to put it there. But it's anticipating, it's gambling, it's taking the chance. And I think going back to your point again about its practice design, it's do they replicate and does do some of the training sessions actually really rehearse and revise what you're going to face on a match day? Because time and time again, I see so many sessions where players are having a shot. They're not having another shot for six or seven goes. They're coming back, the breathing's comfortable, the calm. That's not what the game's about. So how many times do question, coaches actually question themselves and go, well, actually, that is what the game is about come Saturday? Yeah, brilliant. OK, well, we'll just move on to the next slide, Jimmy. And again, I think you're going to talk a little bit about this, aren't you, about some of the, the technical and tactical characteristics of, of centre forwards and number nines? Yeah, so, you know, you look at um, the characteristics. So if we look in the technical, outstanding finishing skills, um, and the tactical is the, the the understanding of effective movement, and it's just it's just you know how do we how do we get our players to be in the position of Harry Kane and that kind of thing, and it's it's going back to the practice designs again, Steve, and and you look at these technical ca characteristics in this next slide and the definition of them. So Harry, we've seen you know, and we've seen with Calvert Lewin, and we've seen with Sancho the different types of finishes. So the first one where Harry does that reverse pass, it's more of a in-step touch laces type of thing. Um, when we get 
Dominic Calvert-Lewin, it's it's a different surface because it's his head. With a Jaden Sancho, it's a different surface because it's actually the side of the foot. So different surfaces from different ranges. Um, and again, you have to, the coaches that, again, that are listening on this, have to make sure that you give your players the opportunity to try these things. You still, a goal is still given if it bounces off your kneecap, Steve. And, we, you know, you like you were saying earlier on that, you know, spanking it in from five yards out and you used to annoy the goalkeepers. And I agree with that. But equally, if that ball just goes over that line and it buzzes on the referee's watch and it's a goal, then it's a goal. You still only get one goal. You don't get four goals for a, an unbelievable finish. You get you get one goal. And we all used to love scoring the great goals. Of course we do. But you know what? As I got older in my day, I certainly didn't mind a scruffy finish at all. I'd be very happy with it. Um so just just looking at that different surfaces and 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 what 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 surface you use again loads and loads of repetition you won't be picking a, a ball out of a a, a a surface out of a, a bag when that ball's coming over from across it just will happen naturally because your muscle memory will have done it many many times and it'll be ingrained in you to do it the underpinning detail is the finishing with accuracy the angles of both feet Again, we finished, we talked about uh, Tammy Abrahams, just opening that, that foot up a tiny little angle just to so it goes on target as opposed to missing. You know, um, what surface from across? What's the detail? I'm going to use my head. I'm going to use my foot. I'm going to jump and, and side volley the ball into to the, to the goal. Um, finishes from outside the area, whipped or driven. When do you use that? How do you use it? So a whip one for me, what I call it bending it round. The whip one is and you and using the defender. Is the defender in the line of the goalkeeper? Again, as you grow, as you grow and you get experience, you will feel that. You'll sense that. You'll sense that that defender is blocking the goalkeeper's view. So use the defender as a wall, as as, as a you know as part of your armory to say right. I'm going to bend that round now. I'm going to whip it round with pace. And you know what? The keeper won't see it and he'll dive late. And then your reactive finishes that we talked about, um, you know, where Harry Kane was in that area and he can he, he can jump on anything that Jaden Sancho misses or Ross Barkley doesn't get hold of. But again, how do you how do you replicate that in training? Can you have a number of different types of with the ball bouncing, the ball coming off at different angles? Um, go back to Calvert Lewin on the bobble. Make sure that you replicate those things that are real and relevant to what you want your strikers to look like. Yeah, some some fascinating insight, Jimmy. I, I think for me, one of the things that stand out is, is knowing the surface and the type of finish that you are going to use in a particular given moment and given the context of the game. And the amount of times I'll see, you know, you're at an angle, you're on your right foot, and there's a lot of coaches out there and players who would probably select to, to bend one in and to use your words, whip it across towards the far post because... You've always got a second opportunity. The goalkeeper may parry. It might go on to it might go out for a corner. But the amount of times I see younger players decide to go with power and with laces, where you're probably not going to score too many from there, and it, it is the other one. And I think over over time and experience, you do gain an understanding of well, actually, that is probably best at this moment right now. And that's not to say you can't mix it up and you can't be creative and you can't give the eyes to the goalkeeper to whip it to the far post, but you whip it in the near. But I think that takes it takes years of experience, belief in your ability, and ultimately you've got to be able to execute that because if I'm the centre forward and I was playing with you, Jimmy, and you chose something that wasn't the right decision, then you're liable to perhaps get a little bit of a rollicking and a telling off from everyone else on that pitch, and rightfully so. But then again, as strikers... That's water off a duck's back. You've got to go, well, actually, I thought it was the right one. I just didn't execute it. So next time I might do it again. But that sort of ability in that cycle, psychological social corner to, to link those two together and not in isolation, I think is vital. Agreed. So, so Jimmy, we're going to go on, aren't yeah, we? Go on, Steve. Sorry, I missed that. No, no, I said we talk a little bit now more so about the technical, sorry, the tactical characteristics rather than technical. Yeah, again, it, the understanding of the effective movement. So um, the definition in, in our, our point of view is to utilise different runs to arrive in goal scoring positions. Um, and again, you'll see different goals scored in the videos that are coming up a little bit later. But it's it's when to make those runs, how to make those runs, the timing of those runs, you know, they don't just happen overnight. 
you've got, and I know I keep harping back to practice design, but you've got to give your players the chance to practice these, but not just for five minutes, that they need to do them time and time and time again. Um, so how do they create space for themselves? How do they create space for others? Um, and then how do they connect with each other? And that was one of your things way back, Steve. And I go back to that social element of the four corners. You know, is it you connect on a football pitch, you connect off the football pitch, and then somehow you connect together all the time. And, and, and the best combinations, relationships, you know, they don't just happen every time a player and the two players or the three players or four players walk onto a football pitch. They work off the pitch. They work when they're having breakfast together, when they're having lunch together, when they're talking about the game together, when they're looking back on the clips. You know, someone says, oh, I don't know, you should have maybe put that in a bit earlier for me. So if you look at the Tammy Abraham one and the, he's pointing early doors where he wants to cross, you know, he'll probably go back originally. As I know he still scored, but he'll probably go back and he'll talk to um, whoever put the ball in at that point you know what, if you'd have put that along along the grass for me, I'd have, I'd have slid that in. You've put it behind me. So think about think about that next time. So you, those, you know, connecting with others is really, really important. So when we talk about under, underpinning the detail, it's recognising the movements to come short, then running behind. So I used to call it one for them, one for me. So I'm running short because I want to bring the defender in with me. I want to engage the defender. Now, if the, if the defender stays off me, I can receive the ball into feet and maybe turn. But if I engage the defender and I know that I've got him and go back to what you said, you know whether you're quicker or slower than him. If I know I'm quicker than him, or if we go into the female game, or her, if you're quicker than him or her, can you spin in behind? So it's one run for the defender, one for yourself in behind. And then recognise the, the moments to stretch your opponents. I think Harry uh, Kane showed that really, really good. When, when, you know, in the transition, really did it really, really well. We're going to stretch high now. Um, and then there's times when you go high to come and receive the ball short. But it's still doing those two runs. It's that one run away for you're going to give the defender that run and, check, and, and, and he can run with you or she can run with you. But I tell you what, you're going to dart back now and you're going to be deceptive and, and go underneath the ball as such. So you're going, to, you're going to come back to receive the ball and then play. And then... The last thing on this, obviously, is, and, and it's a frustration of mine, is the timing of the run to stay on side. There's nothing worse than everything breaking down because you you don't teach and you don't work enough with your strikers to stay on side. Because if they're offside, and we know with VAR and everything else that goes on now, you know, they've got to be really spot on in terms of the time of the run to make sure they do stay on side. Yeah, two, two things for me there, Jimmy, that I think are really interesting. I think that... The definition there, when we talk about how, how and when you receive the ball to connect with others, I think, you know, Harry Kane, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, both for club and country are probably quite often single single number nines. They play up front on their own yeah. in a one. And the amount of times when you defend it against two, space is at a premium. And the timing of when you have got space, you need to get that ball played into you pretty quickly. You've got to demand it as a number nine. And I think perhaps a little bit lower down the pyramid and, and working in development, the understanding and the timing of that doesn't quite match up and it's not in sync. So a centre forward may just get an opportunity to get in front of the centre back and it's on. He's there ready to pin, he's ready to lay off and hold, but that ball doesn't come in. But that delay of a fraction of a second is kills him because if then that ball doesn't come, the centre forward, I'm potentially then going to move into a new position and then the centre midfielder or the player plays that ball and you're either not expecting it, you've shown the defenders close the space down. The, the, the ability to connect, connect and the timing of it with teammates is is, is so important. It's, it's paramount. Yeah. And I think, you know, f fundamentally what you mentioned about those types of runs in behind or to feet, you know, you link that back to practice design. How many people actually have the depth to their practice? So a lot of the sessions that I will see, particularly and rightfully so, at, at times, are running around the box. They're in the final 25 yards of the pitch. Yeah. Well, actually, space is at a premium. You look at the Montenegro game there and you look at some other teams, the amount of players that will be occupying that, that first defensive line, there could be, at times, 20 players in there. So you're not going to be able to run in behind. 
No. You might not. You might be, but you might not. So how many times do you actually create depth and depth and length to your practice? So yes, you can run in behind and stretch and get in behind, but you also can come to feet. And I, I see quite often um, a lot of practices that are very easy to to put on. And yes, the centre forward get a load of repetition out of it, but they don't actually encompass everything and all the types of movements that they'll do in the game. So that's perhaps a little little nugget that I wanted to pick up on. No, brilliant. Um, okay, we're just going to move on to another slide now where we're going to focus for a little bit of uh, time specifically around practice design, but we want to show a little bit of the women's game, don't we, and show, show some goals and perhaps really, really focus on the amount of uh, shots, first time finishes, second time finishes, second phase, where we can actually start to have a look at some the implications that it means to how you're going to put that out on the training ground. We'll just play the next video. Yeah, so Jimmy, uh, you know, that, that for me shows a real detailed insight and, you know, credit to the FA team that have looked into this in terms of some of the stats in terms of, of goals scored in, in the WSL. And I think this is really indicative of how it links to session and practice design. And you look at the different techniques of some of the goals that we saw on that video, where top left, you've got the highest, which is 35% you know, in terms of strikes. And if you look actually on the depiction in terms of a heat graph, really, this is the, the deeper the colour, the darker the red shows the higher volume and the lower the, the, the red and the orange and almost green obviously shows the amount of goals that are scored from it. And I think for me, some of the standout goals, uh, and, and again, it links back to our earlier points, most of them are in that second six yard box, Jimmy, are in that triangle again. Can you see that, Jimmy, your end in terms of the goals and the numbers? Yeah, yeah, I've just, just got it now, Steve. Yeah, and I, sorry, I missed a bit of that because of my video for some reason. But um, you talked about that second six-yard box. It is amazing, you know, when uh, – and the different types of, of finish as well in terms of surface. So the strikes on the 35% uh, of the strikes – and then the in-step one for me, 31%, which is really interesting. Obviously, um, I think that something that will be will become less and less because of the issues we have with the heading. Uh, but again, all in that sort of every every a lot of the goals are in that triangle area, or, or like you're saying, Steve, that second six-yard box area. Um, so if we talk about practice design again. What does it look like for you and, and what does it look like for your players? I think it's 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 really important, Jimmy, when you, you think about this more deeply as a coach. And I think, you know, you go back a number of years ago and I still see it in modern day times 
the, the old fashioned session where you'd have the whole squad on a Friday would be coming up and shooting and it'd all be in a line. And I'd look at it as a centre forward and I'd go, hang on, I'm getting one shot out of 20 and I'm also shooting alongside the left back who hasn't scored a goal for four seasons. Surely that's not right. And as much as I think there's a time and a place for that because of the social corner, the psychological aspect, et cetera, you know, I'll look at some of the some of the detail in here and some of the graphics and, and the strike in the top left hand corner. How many goals are scored outside the box from this graphic? Not very many at all. And obviously the closer you get to goal, the closer you get to the penalty box and get inside it, that number ramps up significantly. So how many times do coaches really think about a you know going away from those straight line finishes that happen in the center of goal because that doesn't happen too many times although it does happen how many times do they think about working strikes at different angles one touch two touch how many times do they do that type of finish with tammy abraham where you look there where it starts to get real deep red and orange and it's rehearsing those jelly legs you're tired you've got to go again it's a second phase the cross is coming in i don't think coaches necessarily nowadays to think too much about that and i'm not doing all coaches a disservice because i do i do see some really inventive creative sessions but again it's having an understanding of why you're doing something and don't just settle for second best and do they create that that opportunity for forwards and attackers to actually talk to the coaches and say listen i think i need a little bit more of this i need a little bit more of that these balls and crosses and types of passes are happening to me on saturday but we're not creating goal scoring opportunities for for, for, for for some unknown reason so having that connection between coaches and players i think is important as well I, I, very quickly, Steve, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, even with the work that we do when we go and see coaches and I'm sitting there watching warm-ups in, in senior, you know, senior professional games and I'm watching um, eight players line up for a shot and some of them are centre-backs and left-backs and right-backs and I'm thinking, how often are you going to get a shot in the game today? Yeah, you might get the odd one, but the striker needs that. So, you know, really important, again, to to be aware of who you're including in certain sessions. Yeah. And I think the next slide, doesn't it, just goes again into a little bit more description about the number of touches and yeah. not not difficult to understand that the amount of goals that are scored within that triangle of first time quite often because you haven't got the time to take a second touch. And you look at some of the detail we spoke to about it's using the power of the actual pass into you, whether that's a cross or whether it's a cutback to use that connection, the biggest surface to direct it on target, a high volume of those within the triangle first time. Quite surprisingly, when you look at the two touch, the actual six yard box is only one goal scored from there. But again, it's indicative. You haven't got time and space in there. So linking that back to the practice design, how many do you actually, how many coaches encourage their strikers, attackers, midfielders? It's got to be a first time finish because quite often I'll see sessions where the player will be having a touch, he'll be putting the goalkeeper on his bum and then slotting it where yeah. come Saturday, you haven't got that time nowhere near. No. So even though it's uncomfortable, it may be up by your neck, it may be bobbling sort of midriff. You've got to try and create some surface and some position of your body to allow a first time finish. So is there anything you'd want to pick up on these four four sort of areas at all? Well, it's just, it's, again, it's around the first time finish, Stephen. I was just thinking then and, and trying to relate it. I know I've talked a lot about practice design today. So, you know, if there is that situation where the striker takes too long, he or she doesn't, you know, doesn't execute it quickly, I wouldn't give the goal. So in the practice or in the game, I don't give the goal because I want it to be real. I want it. To, I want them to understand that at the point they'd have done that and got the goalkeeper to sit down, then some defenders getting back and delaying it or, or you know, clearing it off the line. So for me, um, the first time finishes are are really important to work on. Very, very important to work on. Um, and I, I'll be really honest. I would I would do more work around the first time and two touch than I would have done around the three and maybe plus three touch stuff whatsoever. So all of my practice designs would be more around first time and two touch as opposed to the other ones. Um, and I don't, I don't make any apologies for that because, you know, statistics certainly in here show you that that's where, and, and that's the cut type of finish. And this is where we need to make sure that we, we get our players really proficient at doing this. No, I think you're right, Jim, and I'd wholeheartedly agree. I think some of the some of the higher touch stuff, the three touch, the three touch plus, that still can happen very quickly. You know, I think about your ball could be coming into you, you stun it quickly, you move it offline and you're shooting. So even when you talk about three touches, that can still be a fraction of a second. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not delaying or dallying or being time consuming on the ball. That's, you know, as we know, time is a premium with inside that box. You've got to get your shot off or your attempt on target as quickly as possible. Um, Jimmy, we'll what's just really, leave... sorry, what, so, so sorry. What's, really, what's really interesting here, uh, and I know we, haven't re we won't really touch upon it, um, but I also want people to take away a, a little thing around the toe poke finish, which is generally a, 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 that would be a two touch. It might be a stop and a toe poke. Um, and people sort of look at me in a strange way. The toe poke finish is a very understated finish. Um, and, you know, at some point, maybe we can talk uh, on another webinar more about this um, in the future. Yeah, no problem. I think Romario brought that in, didn't he? One of it my certainly favorites. did. Yeah. Pa pace, power, and the goalkeeper never has time to get set. No, no, not at all. OK, we're just going to move on to a session, Jimmy, aren't we? Something that you've delivered recently. Um, yeah, um, I did some stuff. I did some stuff recently with a, a group of players and what it does, it takes into account some uh, something called a corner run, which you see more um, of the England players doing more and more, but you see more modern day footballers. So, you know, when you're looking at the graphic here, um, I've set it up with, with you can have mannequins, you can have a back four, you can have two defenders, three defenders, you can make it as many as you want. But going back to what you said, it doesn't just... It's just not a one-shot finish as such, Steve. So for me, if I just very quickly talk through it. So the coach starts with the ball. The 11 makes that little run inside that um, inside that fullback. He gets into an area or she gets into an area where she can play that box cross that we talked about in behind the back three. What you've got, you've got the seven and the nine arriving. So the opposite wide player, the wide forward or in our day, the opposite winger arriving in the box. You could also have a supporting midfield player coming in behind. So where I've got the the blue counter as such, um, you could have a you could have a supporting player coming in behind. But the idea of this is roll that ball inside. The eleven takes one touch out of his or her feet and puts that ball into that area where it's just behind the the defenders for the strikers to get across or in behind the player. And, and look to score. Then what they do, they recycle themselves. Um, and uh, you'd have the, the deep line midfield player who's, who's the blue in the blue spot for this instance, that would then play a ball into the nine and seven. They would play a little combination. So that tight area, short, tight area stuff. Again, you could put some mannequins here. You could put some players there, whatever, some distraction. Can they combine quickly and get a shot off in and around the box? And then lastly, once the 11's played that box cross, he or she will stay where the small pile of balls is on the, on the outside and he will get or she will get one of those balls out of her feet and then whip another cross in across the second six-yard box for the seven and nine to look to score and, and, and put the ball in the, in the net. Now, you could go through this two or three times per, per, per cycle and then swap players over. That's how I would do it. So if you've got wide forwards, um, you know, you could you could go on the right hand side first and go to the left and then move, move, move across. But what I'm looking for here on, on this particular practice, Steve, is the timing of run from wide, uh, the delivery of the ball in the box, communication of nine and seven, where they go in, movement of nine and seven, the timing of the nine and seven, what surface, so pass into the net, power into the net miss hit into the net or head into the net. And like we said earlier on, and it's no coincidence we put this in here, enjoy celebrating the goal. You know, make a celebration of it. High five each other. Run away to the corner and slide, at, not at the wrong time, but at the right time. Certainly if you put three, if you, if from this sequence, if you score three out of three, I'd be reading away to the corner and giving it a celebration without a doubt. And, you know, I want, I want to walk onto a training ground and I want to watch my players. If it was my group of players or your group of players, I want to watch them enjoying themselves as well and scoring goals. Jimmy, just one question for you. What considerations would you put on the goalkeeper? And I know there's no indication of that there because that, that's yeah. quite an important part in terms of the cross. What, what sort of information would you give to him in terms of coming out of his six yard, but coming for the crosses, staying? I would want the goalkeeper to be live at all points, Steve. So, and the reason I make is because I want it to be real and it have relevance because in a game, a goalkeeper is going to come and collect or maybe not. You know, if you know you've got a goalkeeper who stays on their line, then this is the perfect kind of um, 
uh, session for me that you would use. But equally, I do want the goalkeepers to come out and be strong. Obviously, I'm going to be saying don't clatter each other. You've got to be a little bit careful so you, uh, we don't want any injuries. But I want the goalkeeper to be full on in, in everything they do. Um, so if they're coming, can they come, come aggressive and come and catch or punch or whatever they need to do? Equally, this session, Steve, will allow the goalkeeper to recycle themselves as well. Mm. So they're not just getting, you know, they, the, the, the strikers on the first part are having, having a shot of goal. Then while they go and recycle themselves and combine, the goalkeeper can pose in again. And then the last one, he gets a chance or she gets a chance to set themselves again because the, the, the nine and seven have to recycle. So I have taken into consideration that it's not necessarily bang, 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 bang into the goalkeeper, but it does come quite quick and quite fast. And we all know in games that goalkeepers might have to make a double, a triple save. I don't think it's very rare they make a quadruple save, but they certainly might have to do a triple, you know, make a triple save quite quickly in succession. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, we just come on to another bit now, Jimmy. Is, is this another yeah. one you did recently? This, this, this is just um, a crossing and finishing chaos, really, in a way. So, um, basically, what, what you do, you get two, 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 three, a set of forwards, so three blues and three yellows. They're going in the opposite direction. So the yellows would go out to the yellow crosses. Um, and the three of them, the three yellows would make movements to look to score. You've got one defender in each end. So um, the blue defender would defend against the yellows. The yellow defender would defend against the blues. Obviously, you've got to give the yellows... Um, the yellow and blue defender, some kind of motivation. So if they clear or the ball doesn't go in the net, obviously it's a point to them. If the, the strikers score, then that's fine. It's, it's a point to them. So basically what we do, we get the ball, we get the little combination playing in this middle bit here. Ball goes out wide. You've got a little overlap or a little underlap, although I've put the arrow as an overlap from, from the wide player so to the fullback. And then the ball goes in the box and looking at the three of them to score. So the reason I put um, wide players even, like diagonally away from each other is we change the way we go and score sometimes. So what you'd do, you'd have a you'd have a, a a blue defender at one end as well and a yellow defender at the other end, so you can swap over. And and on this one here, basically what I do is I just use this as a quick fire finishing session, and we put a time limit on this. So this might be two minutes. And we're having yellows versus blues. We're looking at finishing, but it's finishing in and around the box. And we're looking at types of finish, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you can put loads of constraints on this. It can be, you know, if you score, I know I said you only get one goal for a goal. I know you do, but for the point of making the practice more competitive, if you score a volley, it might be worth two points. If you score a header, it might be worth three points. If you score a diving header, it might be worth four points. You know, if you score a... If you want to work more on scruffy goals, give the scruffy goals more points. You know, give the wonderful goals just a one pointer. Um, but what you do, this this can be this can be a number of things. This session, it can be a chaotic quick fire finishing session. It can be a high speed uh, interval finishing session. But you are getting lots and lots of repetition in order to work your strikers in the box, but also you're working combination play with your wide fullback and your overlapping, um, sorry, your wide winger and your overlapping fullback as well. And would you, Jimmy, would you mix it up so you'd allow the the wide players to cross from different positions, from deeper, and would you allow them to swap sides? You've got inverted crosses, so you had some realistic game demands and scenarios. Steve, absolutely. Look, this graphic doesn't tell the picture in any way. It's just a, a graphic to show what I would do, but you're absolutely spot on. So, those yellows and those blues that are wide could actually come together basically centrally and be able to have a touch out their feet or a little touch to the fullback and then they whip it in. Um, equally, like you're saying, Steve, you could have a ball out wide, the, the, the winger, the, the fullback goes round the winger and then comes back round the outside of him for that inverted cross. So there, there's so many things that you can set up. So this really is, you know, 36 yards uh, deep. And it's 44 yards wide. It's two two 18-yard boxes that we're looking at. And, and we're just lots and lots of types of finishes. Um, but I put I always put a clock on this type of session because I want it done with pace, uh, with aggression, 
But I also then just say, right, after two minutes, stop, count your things up, change your players round, give them a breather, high intensity, but short spurts of it. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. I think, you know, session plans, when the, the visual are always a, a, a basic fundamental of, of the start of a session. This could be tweaked, amended, modified to fit anyone's purposes. So for anyone, anyone who does watch this and are happy to steal this with pride, please add to it, build it up, add more players, take players away, utilise it for your own purposes and your own players. But I think it's a really intriguing insight into something that, that you would do in club and when you're observing coaches to try and help develop them. And, you know, at times when we sit alongside them, try and tweak and help them and, and build and see how they develop their practice, whether that's from front to back or back to front with the end in mind. The last thing I want to say on this, Steve, is I, I, the rip because people will have what's the rationale for the defenders the defender is allowed the defender picks up one person so I'm actually working the defender as well make your choice of which striker you're going to go to and that striker then becomes the one that you mark and then that striker for me needs to understand that he, he or she is marked and become the, the selfless you know I'm sorry unselfish and maybe take away the defender for the other two players to score okay thanks Jimmy well, that brings us to the end of our workshop. Hopefully, for everyone that's watched this, ladies and gentlemen, you have picked up some some A insight from national teams, some B some insight that Jimmy and myself have shared regarding the role of the number nine and how that links, not in isolation with the rest of the team. Definitely the seven and the eleven. If you're looking at wide tackers, it may be another centre forward up alongside, but hopefully some of the specific individual technical and tactical attributes of the centre forward or the number nine. Thanks for everyone for your time. Hopefully you enjoyed it.